If you got your Bible and you want to turn to Luke, Luke 24, that's where we're going to be this morning as we open up the scriptures. This is the final chapter of Luke. At Christmas time, we are usually in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Luke, right? I mean, that's, that's the Christmas story. Shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And, and now Luke concludes his gospel. And he concludes it with an interesting story about two disciples who were walking away from Jerusalem to a town called Emmaus. So we often refer to Luke 24 as the road to Emmaus. And I just want to look at this passage this morning. It's a lengthy passage. We're going to go through the passage and uh, make a few points along the way. Now, have you ever been maybe uh, on vacation or uh, maybe on a business trip and you had your GPS handy and, and you're driving along and it told you to make a turn? Like it even told you ahead ahead of time to make the turn, but you didn't make the turn. Okay, I'm glad I'm, I see a few heads nodding. I'm glad I'm not the only person. I miss turns all the time, even when it tells me ahead of time, even when I can see a map. And this little thing comes up that says rerouting. Yeah. You know, the, the Bible's kind of like that. The Bible tells us and tells us and tells us, and sometimes we just skip right past it. And then we have to do a little, a little rerouting. Jesus' disciples had to do some rerouting because everything they thought about Messiah had, had kind of come to a head. I mean, last Sunday we were waving palm branches. If you think about it, they were riding into Jerusalem and they really thought this is it. God's earthly kingdom is starting now and we are in the entourage. And, and everybody Jesus had come in contact with, every enemy, he was just defeating one after the other. He was walking on water. He was casting out demons. He was healing. Nothing could stop Jesus. And so a lot changed in their thinking during this week because now they had seen Jesus go to the cross. We just read it. They had seen the trial happen. It wasn't, in their minds, it wasn't supposed to happen that way. Jesus was supposed to start his kingdom. He was supposed to, to kick the, the, uh, the ruling Roman government out, and they were supposed to establish their theocracy with Jesus as king, as the Messiah, and they were now having to do some rerouting. And I think maybe we can, we can give them a little bit of grace, okay? Because we know the end of the story, but they were living it in the moment. And they had all stood afar off and watched the crucifixion and watched the trial. And now Jesus has been laid in the grave and there's been this report that he has risen. Luke 24, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. Remember, it was the Sabbath, so they had to wait till the Sabbath was over, so that's why they came Sunday morning. When they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened, as it, and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid, they bowed their faces to the earth, and they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? It's a great question. When I, when I go to a graveyard, I'm not looking for live people. And, and Jesus is alive. And so we should look for Jesus among the living. Jesus should be found among the living, right? Jesus lives in us. Paul says it, that it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Jesus it should be found among the living. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And then remember... How he spoke to you while he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. So Jesus had predicted it, but they had kind of not listened to all of the message that day. There were some other things that they were more attracted to and wanted to hear, the stuff about Jesus ruling and being the king. And, and we know from, from the, the gospel accounts that the disciples were sort of having this power struggle over who was going to be the right and who was going to be on the left. In other words, how, what was the, the hierarchy going to be and who was going to get to be at the top and who was going to be at the bottom. And they were maybe a little bit more concerned about that than they were of actually listening to what Jesus was saying. Verse 8, And then they remembered His words. 
They returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they didn't believe them. The first people to bring the news of the resurrection, and they bring it to the apostles themselves, and it seems to fall on deaf, deaf ears. The apostles don't listen. But Peter arose, and he ran to the tomb. There's something he says, I'm going to check it out at least. And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Now we kind of come to the main text that we're going to look at this morning, beginning in verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. And, and within Christianity, the scholars kind of go back and forth on, on who these people were. We know one of their names is Cleopas. And what is unsure of is the identity of this other disciple. Some say it is the wife of Cleopas. Uh, some say it's another disciple. Uh, they're not part of the twelve, but they are disciples, people who have followed Jesus. They've been in Jerusalem for Passover, and now they're headed back home to, their, to where they live in Emmaus. It's about an hour and a half walk if, there's, if nothing slows you down. Two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all the things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus drew near and went with them, but their eyes were restrained. And we see this happening in a couple of places. Their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. Now, some have suggested that perhaps Christ's body did look slightly different after the resurrection, that the resurrection body may look different. But this doesn't say they didn't recognize him because he looked different. It says they didn't recognize him because their eyes were being restrained. So as far as they're concerned, there's a person talking to them, a stranger that they've not met before. And they're walking along having this conversation Maybe you've been in an airport or someplace traveling and you were having a conversation with somebody and, and a random person just kind of jumps up and joins in the conversation. And sometimes that's pleasant and sometimes that's a little odd. And he said to them, what kind of a conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and you're sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you only a stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened here in these days? Where have you been? In a cave? To which Jesus might have replied, well, first of all, I was in a garden praying, and then a crowd came and got me, and then uh, I was falsely accused, and, and then I got crucified, and then I was buried. And, but he doesn't. He, he holds it back. Where have you been? How do you not know? And Jesus said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. What do you see in that sentence? Prophet. Jesus has been downgraded. A week earlier, he was son of David, the Messiah, right? Now, he was a prophet. Again, they don't know the end of the story, so let's give them some grace. They're just processing. They have probably forsaken much to follow Jesus, and now they're on their way back processing. Jesus certainly was a prophet, but that sells it far short. He was also a priest and a king and a Messiah, God himself in the flesh. He was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people, and, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. And then this is interesting. This is another bit of rerouting. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. We thought he was the one to throw off this yoke of oppression. I mean, we've been this oppressed people and the Romans are ruling over us. And, and, and we just thought that Messiah, we thought this prophet, we thought Jesus was going to be the one to throw off that yoke of oppression and redeem Israel. As we sing at Christmas, 
O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That's what they were hoping. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. Yes, and certain of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But, but him they did not see. There's, there's some doubt coming through. There's a lack of understanding. And remember, they don't know that they're talking to Jesus. Their eyes, it has been concealed from their eyes at this moment still. And imagine if you're having a conversation with somebody in an airport or as you're traveling, look at the next sentence Jesus says. This is a pretty bold statement for a stranger who's walked in on the conversation. Then he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. They were pretty good with some of what the prophets had spoken. But they weren't good with all that the prophets had spoken. They loved the verses that talked about a reigning Messiah, delivering Messiah, right? The king. They loved those verses. The verses in the Old Testament that talked about a suffering Messiah or dying, or, not so much of those. Well, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all. Listen, when we come to God, we come to God on God's terms. And we take the whole of Scripture. We don't get the opportunity to just take this piece that we like and, and this piece that we like. No, we've, we've got to take it all. O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? And beginning at Moses and the prophets... He expounded to them all the, in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, speaking of himself in the third person. I love it. It's important for Christians to not only know the New Testament, but to know the Old Testament. That's where the foundation for all of this stuff is. And so Jesus goes back all the way when it says Moses, it's talking about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's going back to creation and he's saying, you remember when Adam and Eve sinned and God had to, to the, there was an animal that had to be killed so that they could have a covering. Like that was a little picture. And then it kept building. And you remember when, when everybody was sinning and God said, I'm going to destroy the world. But he made this ark. He made a way of salvation. Like, hey, that was a little picture. And, and can you imagine? As the Son of God, the, the living Word, begins explaining the written Word to them for this hour and a half, two hour walk. The, the greatest lecture on the Bible on the Old Testament ever given. And they're getting to hear it firsthand. How when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness because people were, being, were, were dying from these snake bites. And all they had to do was look in faith to the one that, uh, that was lifted up. They would be healed. And, and Jesus had said, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, the Son of Man will be lifted up. And, and he's going through the whole of the Old Testament. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. All those little verses like riding on a donkey that we talked about last week. These little places that you may not see, the, 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 the passages in Psalm that describe a crucifixion decades, centuries, millennia before crucifixion was even invented. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them the scriptures and the things concerning himself. And, and I would imagine as they're walking and they start to see the, the town of Emmaus kind of come up on the horizon, maybe they started walking a little slower because they just want to hear they're hearing wisdom straight from God Himself. The Bible opened up to them, the Old Testament, as it's never been before. And, and, and the journey has gotten short now, and, and they probably want to hear more. Then they drew near to the village where they were going. And this is interesting. And He indicated that He would have gone farther. Had they not invited Jesus, Jesus would have kept on going. They were responding to the Word of God, right? Because the Scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so they have this opportunity to invite Jesus in. 
He indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us. It's late. It's towards the evening. The day is far spent. And, and I do think that they are, on one hand, concerned for this person's physical well-being. Traveling at night in this era wasn't a great uh, idea. But I also think they just they wanted to hear more. Their eyes were being opened. Abide with us. It's towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Later in the book of Revelation, the message comes, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. They were moved by the word and they longed to hear more. They didn't want Jesus to continue on. I think of the invitational hymn that we sing sometimes, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Now it came to pass, as they sit down at their table... As he sat down at the table with them, that he took bread and blessed it and broke it and he gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. Now, these disciples weren't there in the upper room. These are not, not part of the twelve. Perhaps Christ's hands extend from his robe and they see the nail prints. But in the breaking of bread, they know him. And then he vanished from their sight. <laughs> And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us? Can you imagine? Their, hey, when he was talking on the road, how did you feel? Oh, it was just like, like, like water to, to a thirsty person, to a desert. I, I just, I loved every second of this. Yeah, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They were concerned about his physical well-being. Now that they know that Jesus has risen from the grave, they're not worried about anything. They get up. It's time to go. And back to Jerusalem, they go. And you can imagine they have this great story to tell. They're like, we're going to tell Peter. Then we're going to tell John. Then we're going to tell James. And it's going to be great. And everybody's going to ask us all these questions. And, and they're so happy. And, and I can just imagine them sort of rehearsing the story as, they, as they're headed back. So they rose up that very hour and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered. And they got ready to say something and then somebody else said, The Lord indeed is risen and has appeared to Simon. And they're like, oh man, we wanted to tell you. <laughs> we came all the way back from Emmaus and then somebody else jumps in right before we get to say it and says, The Lord has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. The scriptures had lit a fire in their heart. And I don't know about you, but I, I love to hear somebody teach, preach, just even read the scriptures. Man, it's just there's something about it. It's the words of life. And I hope you feel the same way that you just long to hear the words of life. As it continues, it says, Now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. So Jesus is able to appear, his resurrected body not bound by time and space, though it is physical. Peace be to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands, my feet, it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And, and while they still did not believe for joy, they're just trying to take it all in. And they marveled. He said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of boiled fish, some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And now it's Bible lesson part two. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. What a Bible lesson that must have been for Jesus. And they're, they're asking questions and he's pointing out all of these things from the Psalms, from the prophets. Then he says to them, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. Why is it necessary? Because it was God's way of salvation for you and for me. We weren't perfect and, and we were sinless and we needed a sinless sacrifice to die in our place for our sins. 
It was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. What did the two disciples say on the way from Emmaus? We thought he was going to redeem Israel. But it wasn't just for them. The message is for us today, for all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. Talking about the Holy Spirit. Tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually praising and blessing God. Amen. And Luke puts down the pen for part one of his writing. What's the takeaway this morning, this Easter Sunday morning? The first is this, that Christ in his mercy seeks out his wandering disciples. And I'm so glad because I've been a wandering disciple. I've been on the road to Emmaus or some other place having all kinds of doubts and questions. And Christ is so merciful. Jesus comes and he meets us and I don't always recognize it. But in his mercy, he seeks out his wandering disciples. Secondly, the overarching message of Scripture is the mission of Jesus. From Genesis to the maps, okay, in the back. Like, it's, it's all about Jesus coming in and redeeming us. All of the things that happened in the Old Testament. I know some of you are reading through the Bible and you're in some really weird stuff. Hey, it's all pointing to Jesus. We needed a better prophet. We needed a better priest. We needed a better king than all of those things that happened in the Old Testament. Everything is a giant arrow pointing to Jesus. And then in the New Testament, it's an arrow pointing at what Jesus has done and that he will come again. The overarching message of Scripture is the mission of Jesus. That Jesus came to die in your place and my place for our sins, to rise again on the third day. That by grace and through faith we might be reconciled to God. It's not by works. We can't earn our way in. Jesus has earned our admittance into heaven. Thirdly, their preconceived notions of who Jesus was and what he was accomplishing were well short of God's massive redemptive plan. And I would say to you, if you decide to follow Jesus, it's not going to all be roses and, and, and just great stuff happening all the time. But... In the trials and in the sufferings, because we all go through trials and sufferings, Christ will be with you. Because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And there will be a redemptive purpose to the sufferings and the difficulties that you face in this life. See, we, we don't only share in the, in the power of his resurrection, but we also share in the fellowship of his sufferings. They had a, a preconceived idea of what following Jesus was going to look like, and a preconceived idea of, of what his plan was. But God's redemptive plan is massive. That, that contrary neighbor that you have, that difficult coworker, maybe a family member, nobody you're going to see today. <laughs> God has brought them into your life, and he's brought you into their life for a redemptive reason. May they see the light of Christ in you and me. Fourthly, opening of Scripture caused them to invite Jesus in and led to the expansion of their understanding because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. When you hear the gospel, you have a decision to make. You will either receive the gospel and become obedient to it or you will reject it. Sometimes we will also say, I need to hear more. Those are the three responses given in Scripture. But the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. If you are not right with God, today is the day to become right with God by grace and through faith. <clears throat> Lastly, once they had received the blessing, they could not keep it to themselves. When these two people, they were sitting there with Jesus and Jesus vanished, they could not stay in Emmaus any longer. The, the, the gravity and blessing of what they had been given had to go back to Jerusalem. It had to spread to all the world. And if you have received the gospel, you can't keep it to yourself. You've got to give it to others. Let us pray. God, I thank you that you love us so much. I thank you that you chase us down in our strains and our wanderings. Lord, that you reveal yourself to us through your word. Give us a hunger and a thirst for your word. 
Lord, I pray that we who have received the gospel would share it with others. And Lord, for any here today who are unsure of their relationship with you, who have not received the forgiveness that comes by placing their faith in you and what you did on the cross for them, Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation where they would come to you confessing their sin and asking for salvation, believing that Christ has paid the price. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.